I talk a lot about the transition between launch phase and growth phase. And and I would say the vast majority of the companies you're talking about that are, you know, 50 year old companies that are still transacting in, in triplicate uh, paper, you know, these types of businesses are still, in my opinion, in launch mode. Like, yeah, yeah, they're kind of in orbit, but they haven't let go of the rocket. Like they haven't like adapted to their orbit. And so now all you got to do is learn that transition from how do I take it from a revenue generating machine that got off the ground into something that is actually performing something in orbit and it's a smooth operation and things just work. I, I think about that a lot. And to me, you know, going all the way back, like I, I agree, I don't think a business is truly, I think it certainly harms the sale value of a business as well, but I, I don't think a business is truly really operating like a business until you have a predictable methodology right. for acquiring customers repeatedly, right? Right. right. Which is kind right. of what you're talking about. And there's tons of businesses out there that are doing millions of dollars a year in revenue that have yep. really, they don't know how they generate business, right? I mean, it's right. just kind of, I don't know, inbound, right? We're a re totally. word of mouth referrals and you'll get, you'll get penalized for that from a valuation standpoint, but it's also totally. an opportunity in a lot of ways. And, you know, I look at the math on, I mean, you can, you can bootstrap a startup for no seed capital. Um, and you can honestly, you know, not in every case, but you can also buy businesses for little to no capital invested, right? right. So either right. you can in theory start for nothing, but I think an average startup probably have a couple hundred grand of seed capital. And sure. I think an average, let's say sure. SBA acquisition will have a couple hundred grand of, of equity investment, right? Cause you can do about a 10% down payment with an SBA loan. Right. Um, but if you ask me, would I rather start with something that has 3 million bucks of revenue, 20 employees, you know, customers, all, you know, a market presence, all kinds of stuff and build on top of that foundation? Or would I rather start from scratch? Love I'm it. putting my money on the, the bucket that already has all, you know, a lot of the puzzle pieces built. Amen. Hey, welcome back to the show. And today I am so excited to have Matt with us because he's talking about all the stuff we love to talk about. Matt, who are you and what do you do? Todd, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I am a, a private equity investor. I'm the founding partner of a company called Eidolon Capital. And Love we're it. a private investment firm that really focuses on acquiring and scaling and, and in most cases, but not always holding uh, lower middle market companies. And as nice. I'm sure you know, the uh, the silver tsunami of of baby boomer businesses that have that are starting to come to market, you know, are right. basically position ourselves in the path of those businesses, buy great companies and and hold them for the long term. And candidly, I, I probably it. probably read one too many Warren Buffett shareholder letters. And I think that <laughs> not that we're anywhere near his level of expertise or, or uh, track record, but uh, that's kind of our thesis in a lot of ways is, has been informed by the same approach of find great businesses, buy them and, yeah. and ideally hold them over time. You know, he started somewhere too. That's right. <laughs> Meaning you'll get there, dude. Just keep on running. Keep on running. Um, I love it. Right. And, Right? I mean, nobody started with a million companies, right? I mean, you start with one at a time, one acquisition at a time. Now, now talk to us about this because, you know, a lot of people in my listening audience, they, when they hear someone's a private equity guy, they kind of like shudder a little bit. Like, the Darth Vader ah. music starts playing. Yeah, right, right, right. Like, they're out to get me. Crap. <laughs> but talk to us about the perspective you have on, on acquisition and how does this model work really and why should people be thinking about this more? Yeah, so it 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 goes all the way back, and and we'll we'll come back. I'll actually, tell you a story about Warren Buffett that kind of got me to this place of really focusing my time and energy on mergers and acquisitions. But love it, you know, I'm a very avid reader, and and especially when I was younger, I really spent a lot of time studying billionaires. Right? It was hey, these people right. have achieved some incredible level of success, right. and I know you've interviewed hundreds of CEOs and, and have yeah. a similar approach to trying to learn from really smart people. Right. right. And I, I started studying all these billionaires and what I came to see over and over again was that there was this big commonality in many billionaire growth stories. And the spoiler is that the commonality was that they used M and a to grow. They bought businesses, right. And, and many different contexts. And, and yeah. so if you think about Warren Buffett, that's a pretty obvious one. Berkshire Hathaway's entire strategy is just, Buy businesses, right? There's not right. really 
I mean, there's more to it, but that's the crux of the thesis. Right. But even when you unpack um, people who seemingly maybe don't seem like an M&A story, there's actually a lot right. of M&A under the hood. And one of my favorite examples is Jeff Bezos and Amazon, right? Obviously, he founded Amazon. But right. if you look at some of Amazon's biggest successes, some of their biggest pieces in their growth strategy and their story, I mean, Amazon's almost a $2 trillion company today. Um, acquisitions were really a fundamental piece of their strategy. They've done right. more than 100 acquisitions in the last 15 years or so. Wow. And yeah. I mean, ma major buckets of their business, right? So yeah. I'm a big, uh, I'm a big audiobook guy. Probably 80% of my reading is on audiobooks, specifically on Audible in most cases. Um, right. But Amazon didn't found and create Audible; they acquired it, right? right. And when right. audiobooks were starting to become a big thing, they went and bought Audible. Right. Similarly, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, it would have been a fantasy to imagine your groceries getting delivered to your house in real time. Um, but <laughs> right. Amazon saw the path of growth. They knew that was happening. And instead of going and reinventing billions of dollars worth of grocery infrastructure, they just went and bought Whole Foods, right? And so these, you know, the, even AI today, which is you and I both know is a, probably one of the biggest mega trends. Right. They, you know, Amazon has thousands of employees, you know, billions and billions of dollars. Instead of building a native in-house AI team, they have four billion dollars they've invested in Anthropic, which is one of the leading AI companies. And so, wow, yeah. When you when you look at a story that's seemingly a, a, a you know a startup, right? Really, they're still massively growing by using acquisitions. And uh, the crazy thing about acquisitions that I've uncovered is that you don't have to be an Amazon to go do right. these acquisitions. In fact, some of the most interesting, most compelling deals can be done uh, both as a small business owner who's looking to scale or right. as an entrepreneur who says, and I, I really firmly believe this, if you're going to start a business, I think that there's a really compelling case that the same amount of time, energy, money, resources dedicated to that effort could be much more effectively deployed buying an existing business that already has customers and revenue and traction I hear and product and all kinds of stuff. So I hear you, you know, long honestly, answer, no, I, I, I love that answer because you know, so many people feel like their businesses are baby and there's no way anyone's going to get a piece of that. Or there's no way I would consider, you know, even the fact that other people might be interested in exiting their business. Like you talked about the silver tsunami, people don't even know what that is, you know? And, and yet, I've been born and raised on the fact that we have this massive baby boomer generation that was very entrepreneurial and very smart with their money. And now they want to be done They They are done yep. in a lot of cases. And they're like, I don't know what to do with this thing. And, and, well, and then there's all these young people who are like too scared to go start a business. You don't have yep. to anymore. Like literally what you're doing is really a smart play. And I know there's a lot of opportunity out there. And for those of you listening, you don't always have to be the creator in growth and scaling. You can be the one to go in and grab up something that's working, apply some common, you know, modern stuff to it. Basic stuff in a lot of cases, right. very basic. <laughs> Email, like, right? <laughs> it's, I mean, we've, it's so true. And it's funny because I think there are different kinds of creativity or are there just different ways to channel creativity because right. you can be super creative and go come up with some amazing idea for a business. But to me, I prefer to channel my creativity, not only into the, the craft of doing deals, which I really enjoy personally, but also right. having some raw material to work with to me is a much more rewarding creative experience than starting right. from nothing. And right. I would much right. rather take a business that has some really good bones, some really good fundamentals, yeah. Yeah. And build upon that as opposed to saying, man, I got to start from scratch and duct tape this whole thing together. 100%. And I mean, we've, we've bought, honestly, most of the businesses we buy are so under optimized that it's, it's, I mean, I it's it. wild, right? I mean, we, I get we it. bought a business a couple years ago that was, it was a 51 year old company. Uh, they were doing, you know, three or $4 million of top line revenue, making good money. The entire yeah. business was operated on pen and paper, right? Pen and paper, <laughs> carbon copy sheets. This is oh, in 2022, stop right? Stop it. They, carbon they copy didn't sheets. Have a website, didn't have a website. The whole marketing budget was a TV <laughs> ad from the early 90s that they didn't even stock any of the products for anymore, right? So it's like, you don't have to be some marketing genius to be like, hey, maybe we should you know, do some basic like paid ads and Google and, you know, local right. cert instead right. of this TV ad from the nineties. Right. <laughs> so it's, it's like, 
Or I maybe we should use some software to digitize the operations here instead totally. of having maybe automate an email or response or two or something, right? <laughs> yep. So <laughs> I love you it. Really don't, and and the funny thing is, it it makes sense. I mean, why is yeah. the business that way, right? I mean, if you're making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year and you've owned this thing for twenty years, why do you want to? Why change it? Why bother? You're going to retire in a couple years anyway. Um, right. But the right, reality right. is, you you hit on something a minute ago that I think is so funny. Uh, which is, and I got a comment on like a YouTube video of mine the other day. And this guy was basically like, nobody's ever going to sell their business. Like if it's doing well. And I was like, I was like <laughs> that, that kind of limited thinking is, is it makes me sad, honestly, because that's when you want do, to sell your business is what is doing of, well. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like tens of thousands of businesses transact annually, but beyond that, as you hit on that, depending on what estimates you look at, it's like, there's about 70 million baby boomers. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, I've seen stats, maybe 12 million of them own businesses. So call it 12 million businesses right, um, right. that have to transact. And it's something like $10 trillion worth of value that has to pass out of baby boomer hands over the next 10 or 10 or 15 years. Right. And, you know, as you hit on, like most of their kids don't want to take over, you know, dad's uh, metal fabrication business. Totally. They want to be a TikTok influencer, right? Totally. Or whatever. Totally. Um, I, I saw something. This is like a tangent, but I saw a stat the other day that was like in you in the U.S. It was like the most the most desired profession for you know people under twenty five or whatever was literally yeah. influencer, and it was like it was, it was like China. It was like astronaut, right? So it's like uh, people don't want these businesses, right? And they're, and they're gonna have to transact. So my goal is to be in the path of that tsunami. Very sit smart. there with a net and try and catch a couple that I like. That, Very that's smart. Pretty much it. You know, and sadly enough, uh, I'm pretty familiar with the Asian markets and, uh, you know, Japanese people are having the hardest time with this because they, many of them don't even have kids. And if they do, yeah. the one kid is like, ah, yeah, I'm like cutting hair for a living. And they're like, I don't want your business dad. And so there is a huge opportunity for this. And, and you know, Matt, one of the things I'd love for you to touch on, um, I talk a lot about the transition between launch phase and growth phase and and I would say the vast majority of the companies you're talking about that are, you know, 50 year old companies that are still transacting in, in triplicate uh, paper, you know, these types of businesses are still, in my opinion, in launch mode. Like, yeah, yeah, they're kind of in orbit, but they haven't let go of the rocket. Like they haven't like adapted to their orbit. And so now all you got to do is learn that transition from how do I take it from a revenue generating machine that got off the ground into something that is actually performing something in orbit and it's a smooth operation and things just work. I, I think about that a lot. And to me, you know, going all the way back, like I, I agree, I don't think a business is truly, I think it certainly harms the sale value of a business as well, but I, I don't think a business is truly really operating like a business until you have a predictable methodology right. for acquiring customers repeatedly. Right. 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 Which is kind right. of what you're talking about. And there's tons of businesses out there that are doing millions of dollars a year in revenue that have yep. really, they don't know how they generate business. Right. I mean, it's right. just kind of, I don't know, inbound, right. We're a totally. word of mouth referrals and you'll get, you'll get penalized for that from a valuation standpoint, but it's also totally. an opportunity in a lot of ways. And you know, I look at the math on, I mean, you can, you can bootstrap a startup for no seed capital. Um, and you can honestly, you know, not in every case, but you can also buy businesses for little to no capital invested. Right. right. So either right. you can in theory start for nothing, but I think an average startup probably have a couple hundred grand of seed capital. And sure. I think an average, let's say sure. SBA acquisition will have a couple hundred grand of, of equity investment. Right. Cause you can do about a 10% down payment with an SBA loan. Um, right. but if you ask me, would I rather start with something that has 3 million bucks of revenue, 20 employees, you know, customers, all, you know, a market presence, all kinds of stuff and build on top of that foundation? Or would I rather start from scratch? Love I'm it. putting my money on the, the bucket that already has all, you know, a lot of the puzzle pieces built. Amen. And Amen. I think, it's, it, it, I think it's lower risk and in a lot of ways has a faster path to upside. Because I think yeah. it's easier to go from 3 million to 10 million than it is to go from zero to a million probably. I am so glad you're here. And I just wanted to take a few seconds to tell you about a program that we have assembled with a lot of our podcast guests and a lot of people who are listening to the show who are feeling the same way that they do. There's a recurring theme. 
you'll hear a lot of these founders talk about, I couldn't have done it without my team. I couldn't have done it without a, a support group of peers. I couldn't have done it without having someone to talk to that understood my feeling of isolation as an operator of my business. You see, you're not alone. It is hard running a business and it's even harder when you know you can't express all your deepest concerns and frustrations with your executive team. It makes them nervous. It gets them scared. You don't want scared people on your executive team. So where do you turn? The Captain's Council is where you turn. The Captain's Council it is an organization that we are put together with podcast guests, as well as people who are listening who are in the same boat. You see, peers are the only ones that can give you the type of empathy, the type of advice that only a founder or operator know and understand. Go check it out at captainscouncil.com. I know you're gonna love what you see there. We have put together an organizational structure that has small group settings, a global community of founders and operators, as well as monthly and quarterly in-person events. You're gonna love what you see there. I can't wait for you to check it out and enjoy the rest of this episode. I 100% I agree. And honestly, uh, for those listening, <clears throat> if you're hearing this and thinking, oh crap, what did I just do? What did I get myself into? <clears throat> the fact that you are generating at least a million in revenue says something because to your point, Matt, it takes so much energy, like so much energy to get to your first million. And then once yep. you pass that first million, going to three to five to 10, it is just systems and people. You know, it's like systems, yep. processes, people. That is what gets you there. And so to your point, your model is fantastic because when you're buying an existing structure with 20 people and a few million in revenue, the model works. Like it's functional. But how do we optimize? Yep. And, and I think that that's exactly. where a lot of people feel like, I'm an optimizer. I'm not a creator. How do I do this? So, so as you're looking for deal flow, you know, obviously there's a, there's all these baby boomers who are looking to exit, but but if I'm a if I'm a thirty something and I had a startup for the last ten years and I'm just kind of tired of it, what do I need to be thinking about in order to optimize my exit? Or how do I network with people like you who can help me transition out of my business? into something that you want to grab and hold on to for a while? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And there's, there's, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely a net buyer of businesses, but you know, right. I, I, being a buyer or a seller, if you're transacting, you, you understand the fundamental drivers of value of a company. Right. And right. to me, I mean, you, we could have a five hour conversation about valuation and get into the weeds on a bunch of different <laughs> stuff. But totally. to me, there's really a handful of major drivers. And I know you've done a bunch of research on this too, and, and, right. and I have some really cool insights into it. Um, but if I, if I boil it down to really the stuff that I see driving the biggest changes in a company's valuation, I think there's, there's a handful of things that will like 80, 20 principle, these yeah. three or four things will get you like 80% of the way there. So right, right, the biggest, right. honestly, is size. Just, it is what it is. The big, if you look across every factor, industry, whatever, size is almost the single biggest determinant of valuation. And I, and I don't just mean from like a pound for pound standpoint. And this is something sure. that I think a lot of people don't understand, which is like, if you have a company, I'll give you, a, we'll, we'll do a little bit of math. I'll try to keep it relatively simple. But if you have a company that's doing a million dollars of earnings, right? right? And just say, pick an industry, it could be the same industry, just say HVAC, right? Or home services. Right. Company doing a million bucks of EBITDA or earnings might trade at around a 5x multiple, right? So five right. times EBITDA. Could be, right. could be 3x, could be 5x, could maybe even be 6x. Depends on a lot of stuff, but- Don't let's just expect say, 20. Yeah, no, <laughs> definitely not. But like five is a reasonable midpoint, maybe right. even a little high. Right, um, right, right. Now, if you, take this, if you take that same company and you waved a magic wand and you gave it $10 million of EBITDA, right? Right. That $10 million business, so that the million dollar EBITDA business is worth 5 million bucks at a 5x multiple. You take that and made it a right. $10 million EBITDA business, that multiple easily yeah. goes up to at least a 10, maybe more than right. that, right? Right. So right. now that at a 10 million of earnings and a 10X multiple, that's a $100 million business. So even though the revenue or sorry, the profits went up 10, right. 10X, right? From a million to 10 million, the valuation went up 20X, Love right? It. Yeah. Because bigger companies are worth more even yeah. after you come up with the fact that they're bigger. So pound so, for pound, if it was the same multiple, it'd be a $50 million business at 10 million of earnings. 
but it's a hundred million dollar business. So 50% of the valuation increase is just size alone and nothing else. I love it. So for Um, those of you listening, you may have heard before size doesn't matter. In this case, size matters. Meaningfully. So size and and I'll give you my thoughts about how to increase the size of the business. Um, but right. size to me is probably the biggest factor. And right. then beyond size, there's a couple other things that are pretty solvable <laughs> from an operating standpoint. Um, one of the biggest is is broadly what I would call sort of the customer profile of the business. Right. Being how much concentration do you have to a single customer? High customer concentration alone can torpedo deals, even right. at larger sizes. Right. Um, but so customer concentration and the health of the customer relationship. So you know, right. do you have a lot of customers? Do you have a few customers? Do you have great relationship? Do you have a, a sort of a, you know, standoffish or difficult relationship? Those kinds of things, totally. customer health, net promoter scores, customer concentration, broadly customers is a huge driver of value. Right. Um, another major driver of value, as, as you hit on, are systems as a whole, right? Or operational excellence. So do you have repeatable right. properties, uh, whether that's fulfillment, value creation, customer acquisition, all of the different functions of the business. If you don't have systems, then that will meaningfully impact your valuation on the negative side. Totally. Um, and, then, and then really the last big variable that I see is broadly what I would call management depth or management experience. And, and right. I would include that uh, the other side of the coin on that is owner reliance. So the less reliant yes. the business is on the owner, yes. the more the business has a deep management bench of people that run yeah. it, the more yeah. valuable it is. And so- what? It, I mean, be honest with me, Matt. When you're looking at deals and and you're less than say five million in revenue, how often is there a leadership bench there that you can rely on versus owner dependency? What, oh, how most often deals are, are owner dependent. That? Most yeah. deals are owner dependent, and to right. some extent, right? I mean, there there are deals where people have phased themselves out, and oftentimes you'll have maybe a, a VP of ops or some second in sure. command that can can kind of keep the hand on the tiller. Sure. Um, but but really. In most cases, there's there's some level of owner reliance, right? right? And and so, if if you own a small business and you want to increase the exit value, think removing owner reliance, building management depth, putting yep. systems in place, yeah, building customer diversity or uh, acquiring for customer diversity, right? So I have right. a friend who's actually working on a merger right now. His business is they're, they're a pretty sizable company. They're doing a couple million bucks of EBITDA. Um, right. But they're concentrated like 60% to a single customer. Wow. And they're doing That's a merger. Scary. Yeah. They're doing a merger just to bring that concentration down to like 15 or 20%. Nice. So that then the the merged companies can sell without having a customer concentration blocker, right? So smart. You can, you can use MA to solve some of these issues too. Um, and then size, obviously, and we can we can unpack this in more detail <laughs> if you want, but you can grow via acquisitions, right? Just like good. Amazon you know, does. Go back to that business. Do it too. Go, yeah, go back to that guy because I, I want to talk about that just for a minute because I think that this is really, really creative. You know, I, I did a piece yesterday talking about eight different ways to exit your business and strategic acquisition is by far the most common, I think, in terms of people's ability to exit. I, I would say maybe second most common. Probably the most common is just liquidation, right? Like a liquidation yeah, exit, yeah. <laughs> right? But but when we're talking about a strategic acquisition like this, I absolutely love what you're talking about. The owner, or the founder of that company is looking to exit his company, but to be able to add value by diversifying client type, he's actually acquiring someone else first, which will do what to his overall exit? What, what do you, I mean, what are you seeing? Yeah, so... Uh, I'm trying to remember the exact math on his deal, but I can give you an example that would will illustrate it yeah. just the same. So let's say his business is doing yeah. $4 million of EBITDA and they buy a business that's doing $3 million of EBITDA, right? So, um, and, and this is right. in front of the agency space, marketing agency. So his $4 awesome. million dollar EBITDA business is substantially concentrated to a single customer today, which a lot of right. buyers, uh, if you have even a 20% concentration to a single customer, a lot of private That's equity scary. buyers are just out. Like they won't, they just yeah. will pass, auto pass on the deal. Scary. 50% or yeah. more concentration, forget about it. You're, you're, 80% of the buyer universe is gone outright. Totally. So they may not, I mean, they maybe could find a buyer, but they may not. And, and why is that? Explain why that is. Because I think a lot of people are like, wait, that's awesome. I've got one massive client. Yeah, I mean, it's the reason is really simple, right? It's if you lose that one client, then the whole <laughs> business implodes, right? And, and you know, right. you paid- 15 million dollars for a company 
and now it's worth three million dollars, right, or whatever. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and I, I mean, you know, oh, of course that's never going to happen, but it happens all the time. <laughs> all I know, the time. I know people who it's happened to. I've invested in a company that had fifty percent concentration to a client that fired, you know, fired the business like nine months later. Yeah. Like, I've seen it all, right? So um, that sucks. Yeah. But you know, let's say they have they're four million of EBITDA, but because of this concentration you know, maybe they're getting penalized meaningfully. So they might be worth a four or five X multiple. Whereas if they didn't have concentration, right. they might be worth like a seven X. Um, right. And right, so right. that company's worth, let's say 16 to $20 million on its own. Now they right. go merge. They don't actually have to put any cash into this. They just merge with a company that's doing, let's say $3 million of EBITDA. And that company's sure. worth maybe a six X multiple. So it's worth 18, right? So we'll just right. say the first company's 20, second company's 18. $38 million merged co value, right. Right? right? Now that merged co doesn't have a customer concentration issue anymore. And yeah. it's, yeah. it's now $7 million of EBITDA. So maybe that right. $7 million of EBITDA is now because multiples get bigger as companies get bigger, that $7 million right. EBITDA might be worth an, an 8X or a 9X, right? So wow. you know, seven Love times it. nine is a $63 million company, right? Just from combining That's those two companies and changing nothing else, now that company goes from being worth a merged co of 38 million to, you know, add $30 million on top of the value, basically double the value of the business just by merging. Love it. So Love um, it. there's some crazy stuff you can do. That's just one now, illustration. Th of how thank you for sharing that. Value. That's an amazing illustration because I think that, you know, oftentimes founders tend to think, and especially baby boomer founders tend to think that this is my baby. I've been running this thing for 40, 50 years and I know it inside and out. I know all my clients. This is great. But but if it's owner dependent and if the revenue is not the right size and if the client base is not diversified enough, and I mean, there's lots of variables, but looking at those things, it opens up the door for an amazing opportunity for strategic acquisitions. If you are a business out there listening to this right now and are just thinking, hey, you know what? I want to add some customer base in a different marketplace that opportunity is probably there right now, you know, or, no or if the reason is, you know what, I want to buy a little intellectual property that this company owns and they're looking to exit, you could probably get a sweet deal on IP based acquisition. You yep. know, when you've got a reason for it, there's probably somebody out there that has what you're looking for right now. No. Yeah. There's no question about that. And it's, it's amazing I mean, boiling this down, right? Because you you read about you. Hear, okay, yeah, sure. Jeff Bezos can go buy Audible or whatever, right? But the reality right, is, right. these small businesses are almost better positioned to do a lot of these acquisitions because there's so much low hanging fruit at the bottom end of the sector that big institutional buyers won't right. touch or pay attention to. So if you have if you right, have a business right, that's right. doing three million bucks of top line revenue. And operating at like a 25% profit margin would be about a 750k right. year uh, EBITDA or profit or net income business, right? Um, so that right. business, 750k of profits at a you know, maybe a 4x multiple is worth a three three million dollars, right? So if you have a company that today is right. worth three million dollars, yeah. right? And you said, hey, I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy a small business doing a million dollars of revenue, 20% margins, making 200k a year, right? As companies get smaller, their valuation multiples decrease. So if you buy a company making 200K a year, you might pay a 3X multiple for that. So that 200K, right. re, that 200K profit company might be worth $600,000. And so you go take right. your $3 million business making 750K a year. You buy the 600K right. company making 200K a year. And now your, your right. merged co would be doing 4 million of revenue. It would be doing 950K of, of net income or EBITDA. And now that it's a little bit yep. bigger, maybe it's worth a 5X multiple, right? Instead of a 4X. I and like so it. so that's, that's very achievable, right? If you go, like, if you're a small business owner, buying a company, if you're doing $3 million of revenue, buying somebody doing a million dollars of revenue shouldn't be some Herculean right. task. Like, it's, it's very right. digestible. And the crazy thing is, if you take that $3 million business and that 600 k business, 3.6 million in aggregate. Right. And we'll set aside the question of how to fund that deal because there's all kinds of crazy creative ways you could fund it too. But right, it doesn't right, matter right. how you fund it. If you're doing 950K of, of EBITDA now at a 5X multiple, that's worth yeah. about what? $4.75 million, almost $5 million. So yeah. you've taken 
three right. plus three million plus six hundred K three point six. And now it's worth like four point seven. So you added a million dollars of value just by merging those two companies right. together. Right. And then what okay, what if Crazy. you, you know, let's say you 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 know, you pick up a few cost synergies and maybe you're you're after you have a you know, either duplicate accounting or HR or marketing, whatever, and you take it from nine fifty right. to a million of EBITDA or a million one of EBITDA, that value continues right. to increase. And you do that exponentially gets bigger. Well, you do that once a year, right? So you added a million yeah. dollars of value to your business by buying a, a tiny little company. You do that once a year. Yep. Five years down the road, your company is going to be worth like 10, 10 plus million dollars, right? Not to mention, not to mention that million dollar company that you bought three years ago by adding the systems and processes that you already have in play, margins make up. it probably a three or four million dollar company all by itself. Yep. Right? And, and you can potentially cross sell and upsell products, right? So you can sell your product totally. into their customer base. You can sell their product into your customer base. Um, you know, you can, you should pick up some margin enhancement because you're bigger. There's be right. some natural cost synergies there. So the, right. the, uh, the point I'm trying to illustrate is there's a big opportunity to, for, for small business owners to go and find deals like that. And there's a, right. uh, as we talked about this whole universe of baby boomers that are out there that are retiring, many of them own small sole proprietor type businesses. Totally. And their alternative totally. is just close the doors. Look right? at eight. And I, I've <laughs> heard one of my favorite terms for businesses like that is dancing bear businesses, right? So the idea is when the bear stops <laughs> dancing, the money stops coming in, right? Totally. And, and there's totally. no alternative other than just shut it down and, and liquidate it. Yeah. And so yeah. if you can find someone like that, and give them a path and say, hey, instead of shutting this down, what if we found a way to pay you over the next couple of years and we can get a home for your customers? And if you have employees, we can find a home totally. for your employees too, right? Totally. And then suddenly you can do that 600K acquisition without actually totally. forking over 600K, right? You can do it on an earnout totally. or some sort of seller finance deal structure. And that's when the math right. gets really interesting because then you can start to it gets really fun on a seller finance deal doesn't yeah. it? i mean it's like okay yeah a lot of them are like yeah i don't want to get banks involved either let's just make this happen you know what i mean so i i think it's fantastic what you're talking about this honestly this interview has been so much fun because i do believe that many of our listeners out there are in the position of thinking okay i've never really thought about acquisition this is making sense or they're thinking I started this business, I'm generating a few million in revenue, but I'm kind of burned out. Yep. I kind of want to find one of those strategic buyers. And how do they go about doing that? Like, what does that look like when, when somebody's like, oh, I'm just kind of worn out with this thing. Who's looking? Where, do they, where should they go? I mean, in this, in this market, buyers are pretty active. <laughs> so if you own a business, a couple yeah. million bucks of revenue, depending on the industry you're in, you're probably already getting yeah. tons of inbound. Like tons of PE buyers <laughs> reaching out and sending you emails. Um, if you're yeah. not, then you could probably call a, a, a broker or an advisor. And candidly, uh, there's pros and cons to selling a business with and without an advisor. I personally, right. most of the deals we sell, I like to bring somebody in, even though it costs right. us a piece of the deal price as a commission, mostly because you're yeah. just creating a lot more competition, you're creating a lot more leverage, you're Interesting. Uh, connecting with a much wider pool of prospective buyers than you otherwise could. But right. if, 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 if you're a small business owner, you're thinking about exiting or even just want to kind of get a sense of what's going on in the market, I, I think it's fantastic to just take a couple calls with buyers who are in your space and see what they say. Yeah. Because if, if you inverted yeah. this and, and you do this thought experiment where you reframe it and you say, hey, if I had a bunch of highly paid Ivy League MBAs come in and give you right. a free consulting review of your business where they're going to come in and tell you everything right. that's wrong with it, right? How excited would you be, right? How, would that probably be worth <laughs> tens of thousands of dollars, right? Well, right. This is, right. all of these highly paid Ivy Leaguers all work for private equity firms and their job is to get on the phone and to tell you 100%. why they're not going to pay you what you think your business is worth. <laughs> and so they're going to come in and they're going to, and you, if you set your ego aside, they're going to all like, the things that are wrong. Yeah. They're going to tell, tell you everything. They'll be like, Hey, your customer concentration is too high. We don't like this. This margin is too low. Your growth rate yeah. is too low. You know, you don't have enough management right. experience and blah, blah, blah. And then you, boom, there's the roadmap. 
Okay, that's hilarious. I like, love that. That is such a smart idea. What what a great way to get a free consultation, right? Yeah. And <laughs> and you get the roadmap. Like it's it's not necessarily easy yeah. to execute, but if you want the playbook for what a what a private equity buyer is willing to pay, go ask them and they'll tell you. And the crazy, like the, <laughs> you can even take it one step further and and you can get on the phone, you can ask them directly. You can say, "Hey, the businesses that you pay the most for, what do they look yeah. like? Yeah. Right? The businesses in my yeah. industry that you yeah. guys have paid the highest multiples for, what yeah. characteristics did they have? And then you can yeah. say, okay, how can I go out and re-engineer what we're doing to look more like that? I love it. I love it. This is so fun. Uh, honestly, I appreciate this so much, Matt. This is a this is a great conversation to be had with our with our audience because this is the question that looms on everyone's mind. Um, I, I teach people all the time that if you don't have multiple exit strategies in your head dancing around and and especially even one or two that are really like mapped out in a spreadsheet, in a pro forma, in some kind of a plan, you're not going to get the best valuation. You're not going to get the best price for your business at, when you are ready to go. Definitely not. And sometimes you got to be ready sooner than you want to be. So know what your potential outcomes are before you dive in too deep into your business, is my opinion. I think that's super smart. And I mean, if you classic saying, but if you fail to plan, then you're planning to fail, right? So 100%. doing a little bit of homework can go a long way as you think about yeah. what evaluating strategic decisions, allocating resources, what direction should we go in? Should we invest in this project or this project? Okay, well, the folks yep. who invested yep. in project B are getting, <clears throat> you know, two X higher multiples from private equity buyers than the folks who, who did totally. project A. I wonder which one's going to create more long-term value. Totally. Totally. I love it. I love it. And as you look, you know, at the businesses that have been the most profitable for you, or, or let's say have been the most successful acquisitions for you. Um, what's one thing in common that you feel like was like, okay, this was a no brainer when you acquired, when you made the deal. That's something that we talk about a lot in our portfolio and trying to reverse engineer our biggest wins. Um, the answer May surprise you, it may not. Honestly, what we found generally is that the smallest deals were the biggest headaches. And as I said, size is a driver of value. So for us, interesting, interesting. We've continually just moved our <laughs> minimum deal size up as we've done more transactions. Interesting. Because small deals are just way more headache for for less reward, right? There's, uh, I'll, I mean, the most. I'll give you a simple example, but I think it encapsulates it really well. If you have a business, we talked about most of these smaller businesses don't have real management depth. Now, maybe there's some folks right. that can kind of keep the wheels on, but there's not a real right, right, executive right. running it, making strategic decisions for the business, et cetera. And right. so if you take right. a business that's making $300,000 a year of profit and you buy that right. company, setting aside questions of whether you're using some cash flow for debt service or whatever, if you buy that business right. and, and you go hire, I mean, you know this as well as I do. If you, have a, if you are a true all-star CEO, they could easily have a comp package yeah. in the seven figures, right? But let's just say oh, you, totally. you, you you want to bring somebody in and pay them 250 grand a year, which is on the lower yeah. side for really like an all-star, right? I mean, but you could find right. good people for 250 grand a year or 300 grand a year, maybe throw some equity in right. or whatever. That's if, you have, if you're making 300K a year of, of net income and you hire somebody for 300 grand a year, 100% of your net income is going to that one executive. If you, sure. if you buy a business with $2 million a, a year of earnings, you can hire the same yeah. executive and it's 10 or 15% of your net income. Smart. Right? Yeah. That Smart. alone. Yeah. And those 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 same two companies, the company that's doing 2 million a year of profit probably has a payroll of what? 20, 30, 50 people. The the company that's making 300k a year might have 5, 7, maybe five. 10 or yeah, 12. Yeah, I was going to say 5 to 10. Yeah. yeah. Right? So, which of those is going to be less of a headache for you as the owner <laughs> of the business? The one with 50 100%. employees that are dealing with all this stuff and you hire the high-powered executive and you still have 90% of your cash flow left or the one that Love it. you can't even hire this person because it would eat all of your cash flows and you have six people there to try and put out fires every day. So, so smart. <laughs> probably so smart. not the uh, That's great advice. But that 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 demonstrates what I'm talking about. That That is the reason why multiples are bigger for bigger companies. And that's the opportunity right. to buy these small businesses because if you buy them at small company prices, put them all together under one umbrella and sell it for yep. a big company price, that's how you can really create a lot of economic value. 
Fantastic. Fantastic. And and I know that you are also, you know, when you're working with these CEOs or you're working on bringing in CEOs to run these acquisitions that you have, um, I know you're a big advocate for peer groups. What, what is your thought on that before we go? I, I just, I'm curious, how do you help these people feel like they're not alone in what they're doing in running these organizations? Yeah, I mean, I'm a huge believer in in peer groups and and masterminds and you know whatever you want to call them. I've been a member of a right. bunch of them. Uh, I'm a, I'm <clears throat> I'm an active member of YPO, um, uh -huh. uh, which is you know one of many great organizations out there. But totally. that's been tremendously valuable for me. Um, and you know, I've just found that having folks around you that can help you think through problems, and also just having a, the ability to unlock and access the network of other people that are totally. also wanting to help you out is tremendously valuable. Um, and we can totally. get into some network science around that kind of stuff too, if you want. But the, the short version is, I think it's really, really instrumental. Cool. This has been a fantastic interview. And, and I love I love the advice. I love the insights. You know, These are things that a lot of people wonder about that don't really know about. And I'm glad that you were able to express it in such a, a very tangible, real way, because this is your world. This is what you do every day. And so yep. I appreciate that very much. Uh, we're putting all of your info down below in terms of your your uh, PE group and and other things like that. What else should people know about working with Matt and and what could that look like for them? Yeah, so I've I've got a free newsletter. It's called the Deal Mastery Insider. Uh, cool. You can get it at mattbodner.com uh, and and sign up. And on that newsletter, I talk about buying businesses, selling businesses, doing deals, cool. uh, going to all kinds of case studies about a lot of the stuff we talked about on here, getting into the Love math it. and lots of the art and science of, of buying businesses. And, and love I, I love to talk about mergers and acquisitions and, and buying companies. And cool. that's what we talk about in the, uh, on my newsletter. Love it. For those that are looking for that, make sure you sign up below. And Matt, we, again, thank you so much for taking the time to do this with us today. Uh, added a lot of value to our community and we totally appreciate you being here. Awesome. Well, Todd, thank you so much for having me on the show. Great conversation, awesome questions, and I really appreciate uh, being able to come here and, and share some, some insights and wisdom with everybody. Fantastic. For those listening, make sure to tune in, get that newsletter, and we will catch you on the next episode. Thanks so much for being here, Matt. Thank you, Todd. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Honestly, what a fun interview. What a great guy and what a cool business model. There are so many businesses out there just ripe for the taking. If you are growing a business right now and launch is hard for you, uh, consider acquisition. Consider buying someone else's business that is doing well already, just needs a fresh operator to take that thing and go bigger with it. So that could be you. Maybe you're not the startup guy. Maybe you're the person that just comes in and acquires and builds and grows. It's all growth and scaling to me. There is a specific type of mindset and a specific type of person that is great for launching. There's another whole mindset that can be taken from a great operator of someone else's business and jump into this operator role of acquisition and operating. And growing and scaling that way is sometimes a bigger benefit to you. So take a look at these options, take a look at how this all works. And more than anything, if you are on the path to exit, you should be considering all the different growth blockers that are in your way from exiting at the highest possible outcome. Check out growthreadiness.com. Growthreadiness.com will tell you, are you growth ready? If you're not growth ready, guess what? Your exit's going to be pretty poor. But if you are growth ready, you're either going to be building and growing when it comes time to exit, or that acquisition partner is going to look at you and say, you are the perfect business because you've got these check boxes checked. I'm ready to go. Let's do this deal. And so take a look at growthreadiness.com. Take our free assessment and or sign up for one of our amazing workshops where we work through all of the 12 checkpoints we talked about and you go home as a winner, a bigger winner than you came in. So check it out. We'll talk to you then. Appreciate all your time.